um, giving you some uh, inputs and uh, examples. We will, uh, with her, you will discuss uh, a certain case of the Sydney Opera House. I'm sure that you are familiar with this uh, quite ex exceptional piece of architecture, but now we will look at this uh, building from a different perspective and see how they handled uh, the, their problem and uh, applying this model uh, come with uh, come up with very interesting solutions for their citizens and uh, the use of the space. And then our colleague Susanna will present another case study, also applying this model, uh, where we had a very interesting topic of um, coming up with solutions which are uh, reflecting on the natural natural and cultural natural resources and cultural heritage in a famous area that we have here, uh, Ohrid, Ohrid Lake and the environment and proposing strategic documents of how this should be preserved. So this is the agenda for today. We have one hour and 30 minutes to cover all these topics. And of course, we will have time for our discussion and uh, questions at the end. Uh, I will just announce here at the beginning that uh, it is expected you to submit very short essays applying this model that we will discuss today. And the deadline is 20th of January. So please uh, follow us carefully and uh, don't uh, hesitate to ask uh, or to stop during also the, our presentation for more clear, just um, clarification of some terminology and clear understanding of what this model actually and the phases are. Um, so we, are yeah more and more people are coming yes around 40 people at the and uh, i will share uh what we have prepared as a presentation uh just to for more easy uh, following but please even though we cannot see face to face please feel free to interrupt and stop and ask questions during this process So the topic solving complex problem and the model is frame creation model. Solving complex problems is the, the topic that we've decided it is very much important because the whole project and all that we are, uh, you are actually also with us doing is tackling a quite important uh, topic of sustainable cities and as you all have already notion and awareness that it is quite complex as a topic so in this one hour and a half what are we going to do today it will be to learn what actually are these open complex dynamic and network problems and how we will define these problems what are their characteristics are there any different from other type of problems? Why is this? Why is it that these complex problems are so important? And uh, uh, recognize uh, the typical challenges that we have in the process of solving problems. We will then pr present also the model, frame creation model, and uh, with the, all the cases and uh, application. Uh, we will describe how actually these complex problems can be solved using the frame creation model. Uh, I already mentioned we will have, have two case studies today. One is the Sydney Opera House and another one is the study of Ocrid. And what is expected from you, not from today, but until 20th of January, is to apply framework creation model in your studio projects. The topic is to choose or, or to use more, more uh, better say, uh, already that the problem that you are tackling already, creating solutions and looking at this problem, applying this model. So uh, let's uh, uh, discuss a little bit now, what actually do we mean when we say a problem and what are your associations when you hear the word problem?
So the floor is open. So please, you can feel free to comment at this moment. Or I can ask somebody to to say something. I I see a name of Vanessa here. We have a colleague. Mm -hmm. This drawing option is at the moment applicable for you as well, but it is not intended to be used. Okay, so when we say problem, <laughs> uh, if you look at the definition of what a problem is, you can see it from a mathematical point of view, solving a certain equation, uh, you have problems where you are, when you are designing things in your field of architecture as well. And if we look at it uh, from a diction, uh, from a, you know, word meaning and uh, checking different di dictionaries, one of the uh, definition that we found and we stated here in the presentation is when there is a certain situation where there is a unwelcome, sometimes even harmful situation, and there is a need this situation to be dealt and a solution um, to be found or over, this solution to be overcome as such. And uh, just uh, to add to this, uh, uh, in Cambridge Dictionary, something that is more of um, the moment of the need when there is a certain situation which is uh, in a way disturbing or in an unbalanced way uh, provoking us this need for the, uh, the moment we recognize that there is a problem uh, immediately finding or starting to think about uh, these solutions. Sometimes this process is very much on the go. So we don't even invest and see all the phases that are usually there, all the skills that we should employ when we're talking about so, uh, skills of problem solving. So this, in a way, comes automatically for us. We see a problem, already we have solution for it. Sometimes there is a repetition of situations, so we don't have to go through the whole process again. But what is a specific this is the, this is very normal and typical when we are discussing about um, everyday situations. But what will happen, and what is the situation when um, we actually are talking about very specific problems, which are uh, we say complex problems? So, what are the characteristics of these uh, co uh, complex problems? They're also called wicked problems because or um, not well specified, ill specified problems, because uh, in a way it is very hard to analyze and to see what is the beginning, what is the end, which, what was the cause and what is the effect. Somehow, somehow all it is interconnected and in all this uh, we just know that this, there is a problem, but really looking and finding, okay, what should be done in this situation, it takes more effort than the usual type of problems. Okay, so the characteristics of these wicked problems are the following. They're open, they're complex, dynamic, and networked. Open meaning more, more parties are involved and um, no boundaries, re no real boundaries are, uh, are set as such. So there is an overlapping and a fluctuation from one problem to one gram situation to another reflecting on all the parties involved they have many elements but also there are um, layers of um, relationships old and new uh, different type of relationships 
between the involved parties or in the involved stakeholders. What is also a, a, a typical characteristic of these bigger problems is the dynamic principle. So there is a lot of change happening all the time. So if we just try to analyze and approach it, at one point the uh, elements are like this, but the very next day a new external environment element can be, can be influencing and a new the uh, set of scene we have at um, this complex problem. And uh, because I already mentioned there are several, um, more than one, two, many stakeholders involved across different organizations. This means that it is also connected. There is a connection between themselves and there is this network that is going on. So really uh, finding out, okay, who, who are these involved parties in these complex problems? What, what is their role? What is their position? What are their needs? What are their interests, expectations, etc.? cetera? Is uh, just on one of the first things that uh, Anna will later on explain in more details to even start finding a solution for this type of problems. And uh, it, uh, we chose this also some quotes for, from Einstein, uh, one of the great minds in the world. And you can see how here he emphasized the moment if there is a problem, how much time it should be spent on thinking about the problem. So really looking at this, especially when we are talking about complex problems, not going very fast on finding solutions. So in these complex problems, what we have is, uh, what is the different actually, it, the, the thinking process doesn't go linearly like this. So we have different approach. That's why we're talking about specific network, specific model that we're proposing, uh, different framework. So you can apply and uh, see this. So this is the typical situation when we are approaching problems, right? We have, we know, okay, we try to answer the what question. So what are the elements? We want to see whether there are some relationship, what are the patterns, and then we will have afterwards what are the outcomes or what are the results, what are the solutions of this problem. But in um, this process, uh, usually what is used is this inductive and deductive reasoning. So here in deduction, what we have, we know, okay, this is the situation, we know how they are interconnected, and based on this, um, notion, we can then conclude, okay, this will be the uh, outcomes from this situation. So we have solid reasoning from cause to effect. And the other, uh, the other way around, when we want to discover patterns or using this in induction method is we don't know actually how this was done. We know what, and we know what are the, what was the outcome of, or more than one outcome. In some situation so we are trying to look at more closely and find how this pattern uh, and how this situation was set and we have another uh, uh, in um, variation of this when actually we don't know what per se is the problem what are the elements but we know what are the outcomes and we know what and how these patterns and how these relationships are so in, uh, this is, um, let's say, more relatable to when we're using experience. So from experience, we try to solve the problem. And this works in, in a situation, in our life situation. But the problem is it doesn't work in situation when we have these complex problems. One thing that uh, it is all uh, characteristic uh, for these uh, type of complex problems is that we know what, kind, what type of outcomes we want. But actually, we're really not sure about what are all the elements and who and how are these uh, patterns and relationship uh, set. So because we have two unknowns in this situation, in this equation, this uh, is a process for exploration, for design thinking, and this creative process that it is very typical for designers. So uh, this is another plus of this model that it is expected for you to, to have uh, and recognize many similarities and you already have this type of skills uh, when you approach and uh, create design. 
So just now transferring to maybe more complex and social aspect of problems. So how this uh, frame creation model works actually? What we are now focusing is to set a specific frame. And we have a connection between the patterns and we uh, the patterns and the outcomes. So in a way, we are discovering new ways to view the problems. So we have new point, uh, these new viewpoints are called frames, and uh, we will talk about how this actually it is done. And why is this beneficial for us? Because in a way, we will have more richer context. So we are uh, spending more time in really looking at the problem. What are what is the history? What is the background? where this is happening so external environment is very much important we will talk about the, the the field as such and what are from here we will see are there any paradoxes this is very uh, interesting phase where we actually found out okay um, how not normal are some situation and these specific complex problems in a way they even seem unsolvable because of this intervened and the, the history that they have and uh, um, even uh, not being aware of, uh, of the archaeology of the history of how this problem came up and uh, it still uh, proceeds to be uh, active. And another important aspect is now if you want to see is how this model frame creation is working for you and for your studio projects. So this is the assignment that you will have and uh, the topics you already have chosen, you have certain problems that you're analyzing and creating designs, but now applying the methodology that we are discussing today, uh, the expectation is to really uh, influence or propose solutions on the how to achieve these new desirable uh, outcomes and also uh, on the what, including maybe new elements, uh, different approach, different relations between these um, elements as such. So one thing that is, is very important when uh, you're dealing with, with uh, this type of problems is really seeing who are the stakeholders and what are their needs. And this is not so easy to do at some points because uh, they're not uh, always clearly stated. So the statements that stakeholders use and their way of communicating something, sometimes it is uh, hidden or not clear enough. So you have to maybe dig a little bit and that's why the first phase is really even called archeology, span meaning digging a little bit and finding out uh, what are their needs? What is their position? What is their expectation? So knowing your stakeholders and uh, from starting uh, from there. Another, let's say, a precondition uh, in an ideal and a optimal situation, doesn't have to be ideal, but an optimal situation when uh, uh, this model is implemented is to have these preconditions which means the clear vision connected to the outcomes to the uh, desired outcomes that the stakeholders have and what how this problem will look like when it is solved what are the best outcomes and also very important the second part willingness to change and create impact because it will require effort from all the parties so the, the, it will not be uh, a solution made just in a day or uh, um, in the imposed. Uh, yes, a solution imposed by one running party, then it is not uh, the model that we are discussing, then it's just a traditional way of dealing with problems. And requires systematic thinking, meaning uh, looking at the system and elements and have this longer also a longer period of um, starting point going further in history but also looking back back in future and foreseeing what futures actually uh, are desired and from that uh, uh, starting the point of uh, solving these complex and wicked problems so as i mentioned stakeholders are very important they can be many different type of groups just here you have listed some, 
but the, this is not uh, the whole list. And it is very important at the beginning when you deal with this type of problems to identify, okay, these are the stakeholders and with uh, progressing, applying the model, look what are their interests, needs and uh, relations among each other. Again, another quote from Einstein, very, very famous and actually very descriptive of this model because with the frame of creating the problems, it is not possible to use the same framework, the same way of thinking to find the solutions also. So a different approach is needed and this approach of frame creation, innovation is the thing for approaching complex problems. So um, I will for a second stop sharing and uh, let me see if there are any questions at this point. You can write in the chat also. This is also good. Okay, if there are not any questions at this moment, please, again, I emphasize use the chat uh, to write the questions. And uh, now I give the floor to my colleague, Anna. She will more in detail present the frame creation methodology, the phases, and one example uh, of a case study. So um, we can proceed. Yeah, super. Hello everyone from my side. We had the pleasure of uh, meeting each other in the previous session. But once again, my name is Anna and as uh, Angelina already introduced, uh, that, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the process. And since you uh, did not share your question, I will start with a question for you, which you can uh, write the answer to in the chat box if you're too shy to speak on the microphone. So, I would like to ask, maybe you noticed, but we did uh, start off the presentation music only black and white color, and this was the style that we continued to. So, all the colors actually had this filter of black and white. So, if we apply the same filter to this picture, and I am to ask you if you can recognize some flags, I'm interested if somebody, some of you actually can recognize. We have three different country, participants from three different countries today on this call. So from Italy, Austria, and Macedonia. And one of your flag is actually present on this picture. And I'm just curious if somebody can recognize the flag of their country in a picture that is black and white. Uh, as I see that there are no answers, I will continue to discovering the colors. And as, yes, and as Einstein already said, uh, we cannot uh, give answers to the question if we look at the same answer. So uh, can just write me in which row and which number can you find uh, the flag of Austria? I see Giuseppina already discovered that even when it was black and white, but with color, I assume it's going to be much, much easier. So can you recognize the flag of Austria here when you see the colors? And where exactly is it located? Okay, third row. And then which column? So one, two, three, four, five, six. Where is the Austrian flag? Four. Very good. Okay, we have different people recognizing it. Great job, guys. And if we actually look and try to find more information, we can find a photo where actually we can look at the names of the flags. So I assume everybody that can read 
is going to be uh, it's, it's going to find very easy to locate the flag of Austria. And this is just about this simple presentation was just about uh, seeing that even though it's this method at first glance can seem very far away and a little bit hard to understand, what it actually is trying to prove is that when we are trying to look at problems from different perspectives, add layers to it, similar to when you're creating your projects, the, much, the different aspects and angles you choose to look and the different layers you discover, are, they are going to, it's going to be much easier for you to find solutions that are going to be uh, applicable for the ideas that you want to present. Today, uh, in the Miroslav and Martin's presentation, you had a spectrum of different environmental conscious ideas that you can implement in your project. So when you're trying to figure out which is the best idea to include in your project, it, even though it's green roofs or somewhat interesting water management system, always try to look at the different perspectives and we encourage you to use this methodology so you can find the solution that is most appropriate for you. Uh, so a little bit about the process. This is the frame creation process and uh, it has nine steps, which now we are going to have a look at. Uh, uh, also, okay, now I see that Giuseppina wrote about the Italian. Yes, great spot for the, this was the reason why these flags were not included uh, in the previous slide, because they are different and they would have been much easier to spot. Uh, back to our uh, nine steps. Uh, we are going to uh, start with the step archaeology. So also feel free to use the chat uh, box. What do you associate with the word archaeology? Uh, for example, for me, it was always this image of Indiana Jones trying and digging and looking for some scary stuff, this adventurous type of discovery. So this is my association with the word archaeology. I'm curious to, if somebody would like to share in the chat box their vision when they hear the word archaeology. Uh, when we're talking about problem solving, uh, and when we say that the first step is archaeology, actually what we mean is that we have to look at uh, the history and uh, investigate in depth what is the history of the problem that we are discovering. So uh, if there are very a little handful of cases where architects had the opportunity to start from scratch and to be um, to, uh, to be given the permit to uh, build the city or build something from uh, you know from nothing. Most of the time, you as well, you work in environments that already are built, that have history, that have context, that are already populated with people. So uh, before approaching uh, either problem, if, if regardless are you working on the case of Prilep or Vienna. It is important to know the archaeology, to know the past of the uh, space you're discovering in order to be able to understand it better and in order to be able to approach the uh, problem. The next step that um, is very interest, uh, very funny and Angelina already mentioned it, it's uh, the step of the paradox. And uh, ha have you heard of uh, the paradox about the egg and the chicken? Uh, also, feel free to use the chat box. Uh, this is uh, one of those things that have, have been talked about forever. And actually, if you're curious, you can see that some people try, or I can say uh, successfully solve this problem. But for most of us, it was always question what, uh, came first, the egg or the chicken? And because it's a circle, it seems impossible to be solved. And um, this can also happen when you are facing problems. Uh, in practice, uh, especially when we are looking at these built environments, they are, uh, you will find very paradox situations where some solutions that are uh, existing are maybe not adequate, and you don't know even how these solutions came about to be in the this built environment, but yet you will have to um, uh, try to improve uh, or try to uh, uh, put them in your solutions afterwards. 
the next step is context. And I love how this picture clearly shows the importance of context. Um, we can look at one thing completely differently if we do not put it in the right context. So also for the environments and the cities that you're working uh, for, uh, especially I will take as an example prelim. Uh, if you do not dive in a little bit in the history, if you don't talk with your professors about it, you might not be aware of the context that you are uh, performing your assignment. And um, this is uh, going to be proven very uh, important for the solutions that you're going to create. If you want to solve a problem, you have to know the context in which this problem is being, uh, the context that has brought up the problem, but also the solution that is going to live in this context. So um, at this point, it's very important to uh, think of the stakeholders, to think who is involved in creating this problem or in creating the solution, and uh, to start thinking how uh, on their perspective, but also try to uh, include them in the solution, not just isolate them from uh, finding the proper solution. So, for example, if you think that uh, you want to uh, explore some environmental options in your project, you cannot exclude the people that are going to be doing environmentally not uh, well thought of actions. You have to include them and include how their behavior will reflect on your solution. The next step uh, from this uh, model is a uh, field. And after we have located the stakeholders, it's very important to even go a little bit further back. So if you're on a map, just think that you're zooming up and you can see not only the stakeholders, but you can see the whole context, the intellectual, the cultural, the spiritual. So uh, try to think of these different dimensions, especially if you're working uh, on housing objects or if you're working on cultural objects. This uh, field can be very um, inspirational, but at the same time, it can give you a very uh, good context about where your solution uh, should uh, be implemented and also who is targeting. Uh, the next um, step is uh, the team. So when we are looking at the problem from the outside, and this can actually be related not only to your projects, but also to your everyday life situations. Sometimes we see something that is a problem, maybe a reaction from someone, and we're thinking, hmm, what's his problem or her problem? But if we dive in deeper, we can see what actually is problem uh, from uh, uh, the outside actually has very deep themes, the very deep emotions underneath. So the theme is something like that. Uh, the theme is trying to discover the emotion, the universal elements in the problem that arrive in this problem. Uh, you will see very interesting theme in the cases that we present. And uh, you cannot discover the themes if you do not do the previous steps, but also if you do not look at the problem very carefully. But uh, this uh, step is very important in order to find the right solutions. Because if we do not know the themes that are underneath the problem, we might uh, have a little bit more shallow approach and try to resolve the symptoms of the problem instead of actually understanding why the problem occurred and provide solution that will prevent of occurring it again. And by now, we went a little bit, uh, like I said, when we were doing the maps, we we're zooming out and zooming out, and we have a very broad aspects. And what one, especially a designer, an architect, at this point, can feel uh, overwhelmed by the information, by all of these different aspects. So uh, it is crucial for now to start stop uh, this process because if we go even further, then we can get lost in all of the sea of information. And uh, this, uh, the frame, the even these frames are in the title of the model, are very important in order to find now the solutions. Uh, so here. After we have researched all of this uh, wide area, we are looking for the common themes that emerge and uh, that uh, can be the solution for the problem's paradox. And uh, we are starting to uh, find the solutions for each problem to find the solutions and try to frame them in uh, different sentences or different phrases. Um, after we do this, it's very important to test out our frames or to test out our solutions. 
So uh, we go to this process that is called futures. So we are trying to predict the future by thinking ahead and see if the frame can be realistic and be, can be set in the environment that the problem is occurring to. This uh, can uh, require a little bit intuition and it's not totally objective, but the uh, architect or the designer can feel what feels right and what a uh, solution maybe is not applicable, maybe it's very um, cost, it's not cost effective or it's very uh, broad or the stakeholders might not like it. So this is a good case where if you got too attached to your um, uh, suggestions, uh, as you often do when you're doing these consultations with the assistants and professors, this is the process where you're like, okay, this doesn't work because of this, this and this. And you also test the what works and you are then going to the next step when you're transforming you have received this feedback that you uh, through this process and you're trying to transform your solution in a way that will be uh, easy or not easy but also it will be realistic and it's going to be able to be implemented and uh, you can uh, look at the short-term changes and the long-term changes that will occur but uh, it's important to focus on finalizing the solution that is going to fit best to your problem. At the end, the last step is integration. So we have went through all of these processes, all of these different stages in order to find out solution that fits the context, that uh, gives a different approach to the problem where we started. And uh, it can become part of the future uh, implementation of the project. So in this case, uh, for you, uh, the implementation uh, for your homework will be to write the essays. But in case, if you decide to actually implement some of these solutions in your cases, you can draw a solution, you can uh, put it in your final work, and this way it's going to be able to reflect upon the final project that you submit for the project. So again, these are the nine steps. And I know it can be, again, a little bit overwhelming, but uh, now we're going to uh, look at the, uh, how uh, Sydney Opera House approached this, uh, their problems with this methodology. And then uh, our trainer, Susanna, again, will go through these uh, steps. So don't worry if you feel that you didn't remember something. You're going to have enough time and examples to practice and to see that you can uh, understand these phases appropriately. Um, the Sydney Opera House is something I believe that you have been taught uh, already in your education. Um, uh, we can send you videos of how it was built, what was the vision, but it is a remarkable uh, monument and uh, it is something that uh, has been seen as a pride of the Australian people. It also has an UNESCO World Heritage Site and it is considered an iconic building. Um, I will now, okay, I, yes, I will now like to share the whole screen because I would like to show you the, this methodology uh, applied to the Sydney Opera House. So uh, a few years back, they have uh, faced different kind of problems. Uh, first of all, uh, a lot of people, a lot of protesters, were climbing uh, and they were um, putting different um, posters or doing graffitis on the shelves. And this was very, um, uh, how, how to say, uh, this was not taken very uh, positively by the stakeholders because uh, the Sydney Opera House, like I said, is an iconic building. It's the Australians are proud of it. And when people wrote slogans on it, it looked like it got dirty or it was not special anymore. Uh, the second problem uh, that they were facing is that uh, due to its uh, design, there were no food and beverage options that were very available. And because people did not have the opportunity to sit down and enjoy a meal, uh, they did not spend a lot of time uh, spending money there. They just took photographs or went to the opera house for the event and they went out. And this mean, meant that uh, even though they ha uh, the Sydney Opera House has around 8 million tourist visitors a year, uh, they cannot be optimized if the tourist just comes and take photos and do not 
uh, have the opportunity to spend money there. So th this was also an economic question uh, to say opportunity uh, cost that uh, was not realized. And also um, because a lot of people uh, cannot uh, come uh, during a show, so a lot of visitors did not have uh, the possibility to experience the cultural side of this monument. So they were also uh, not uh, they were not able to explore these sides uh, of the opera house. They just look at it as uh, something that is uh, Instagram worthy, and then they would be done with the topic. Uh, so what was the vision when? Um, the team that uh, provided these solutions by the uh, framework was approached by the Sydney Opera House. They uh, look at the current state. So they went uh, in the archaeology process and uh, they, uh, here in the current state, you can uh, read all the things that they discovered, but also they pinpoint what are the things that they are looking, what is their vision. That, uh, the Opera House has uh, the potential to be a place for collaboration, yeah, that it can create an, uh, a very enriched cultural experience um, that uh, can be a dynamic, that should not be a, become a museum or a building that uh, is uh, dead, but it should be alive and young people should visit it. So um, they look at the short term and the long term um, aspects of it. And when they were thinking of the paradox, they uh, created this uh, different type of uh, sentences. So for example, and this is something that you, have, you should do with your cases as well. Because the Sydney Opera House is such a special place and an iconic building, it attracts protesters who seek attention. But at the same time, because the Sydney Opera House is an iconic building, it cannot be touched or altered due to heritage listing. So you see, we have this paradox from the one side, uh, we have these situations when it's always people, protesters are looking for attention, so they're always doing something. But at the same time, um, the stakeholders feel that this is something that's sacred and it should not be touched. Uh, on the other hand, uh, so again, we go uh, with the second paradox. Because the Sydney Opera House is such a special place, an iconic building, it attracts protesters. But then, because these protesters need to be prevented, the podium section is closed off for everybody. And because the podium section is closed off for everybody, the Sydney Opera House cannot be fully experienced as a special place. So you see, this is, uh, we started from the same sentence, but then we discovered another paradox. By trying to protect the specialty of the building, we are um, demolishing this image and we are um, preventing people to experience it. Specialty. So uh, when they were uh, set up with this paradox, um, the designers uh, and architect team actually uh, started with exploring the stakeholders and uh, the opera house, the security, uh, the police, um, the tourist uh, providers, but also tourists were also taken in consideration, the food and beverage associations, and uh, again, it's interesting uh, when we are looking at the context to point out that also this uh, uh, ground has uh, aboriginal heritage and also it's an UNESCO protected site but also has 8 million tourists around the world so we see these different stakeholders that sometimes have the same goals but sometimes the opposite that have been taken in consideration when providing the solutions um, so uh, after taking in consideration this context and this field uh, the, um, the theme of uh, the solutions that are provided have been selected uh, with words. So four words uh, have been through all of these provided solutions that we're going to look today. And that is the word connecting, diverting, sensing, and responding. So these are the themes that uh, go through this process. And uh, with the solutions, uh, the designers try to uh, create different frames and uh, apply these frames into future situation uh, with the possibility to transform the place and integrate the solutions into the uh, uh, case study. So uh, the first uh, word was connecting. And um, the vision of the designers was that uh, this place should be uh, 
available at any day and it can provide different entertainment for any uh, time of the day. So morning, day, evening and late night. With these solutions, we can see that uh, the Sydney Opera House is presented in four different lights, thus uh, providing four different types of entertainment for different target groups, not only concentrated at one point in time. Uh, so, for example, in the morning, uh, a morning yoga and exercise sessions are being uh, pr provided as a solution because even now there are some people that come, but because it was not organized, they provided an organized entertainment for people to come and actually experience the cultural place with their own rituals and their own habits, giving it a more special touch and even authentic feel. Uh, another idea about the night uh, program was to uh, create this water projection that create the feeling of floating shells and take it back to the, uh, the visions of the original concept that the, uh, the Sydney Opera House should be a floating structure. Um, so this takes in consideration the stakeholders that will visit the Sydney Opera House at night and that will have this different authentic experience while visiting it. Uh, at the same time, when we are thinking about the stakeholders, um, that are uh, trying to make their living, but also the tourists that are hungry and want to spend more time there enjoying a meal or uh, taste, uh, tasty coffee. Uh, the food and merchandise have been uh, envisioned as food and beverage kiosk that will uh, come in an organic and environmental uh, friendly packaging. So this is also part of uh, the so, uh, the frame that is provided for the theme of connecting. Uh, when we're talking about diverting, um, it's uh, important to uh, point out that uh, because of the Hudson's, the architect's design principles, uh, there are a lot of solutions that cannot be uh, implemented because uh, this building has to uh, stay uh, truthful to its original idea. So uh, this is what, uh, Propose these proposed solutions actually uh, try to um, find the performances in these principles. So we don't have to change the building. We just have to use modern technology and to uh, use the space that we already have. And one of my favorite uh, solutions for this is actually the uh, lead glut projections with transparent, where uh, different shows and different cultural elements can be seen from even the outside of the Sydney Opera House. This way, tourists don't have to pay a ticket and watch some show, but they can experience this atmosphere when they're visiting. And this will uh, give a special note to the cultural aspect of this building. Also different uh, seating arrangements can be, uh, modern uh, seating arrangements can be available as a solution, which would provide again the visitors to have more time to enjoy the space there. Um, also uh, there is a, one modern aspect that is called anti-climber roller where uh, when climbers and protesters are trying to climb the, a handle that will help them will be provided with it but actually that handle will have a sensor that will allow the security guards to be able to react more quickly and promptly to uh, the protesters. So this is a very sneaky way but also solves the uh, decision. Sensing is another theme and uh, with this uh, theme uh, there are also very interesting LED and illuminated light solutions that will uh, provide uh, floor lights and pathways for tourists to move and experience different uh, uh, angles and aspects of the opera house and also can create performance spaces where people uh, can perform on different spaces around the object. And responding, so here you can see a picture of how actually protesters are doing this and how people are trying to clean it, but it's very time consuming. So what the architects actually propose is uh, that uh, there, there is the use of light and also or vaporing that uh, can distract the messages that have been been put also they that can be covered with a screen which is a fast solution until uh, the Singapore house can be cleaned again so this was very briefly uh, representation of some of the cases that uh, and solutions that have been provided to using this frame uh, by a team of 18 architects 
uh, uh, on the Enable platform. I, uh, the presentation is going to be available for sure, but also this full document that originally has more than 40 pages is going to be available. Maybe you can use it as an inspiration. Maybe you can see different methods of how this um, framework was uh, here developed. But in any case, uh, it can be uh, very inspirational for your project as well. And I wanted to hear, yes, you, here you can see the photos of how the architects actually worked on their solutions and how they looked at the field. So when you're submitting your homeworks, uh, we can even uh, include sketches and all the material that you're going to use when trying to find the solution for your uh, case studies. So I would stop the session here because my time is uh, almost up. Uh, if you have some questions, please, uh, I'll be seeing the chat and I can uh, answer you. If you're too shy to write to everyone, you can uh, type the questions directly to us. And we hope uh, that so far you got a better understanding of the framework. Now I would like to leave the floor to Susanna, uh, our researcher. Uh, Susanna speaks uh, Macedonian, German, and Italian. So you can also uh, answer, uh, ask your questions in your native language. And I hope you're going to like her part of the presentation as well. Hello, hello from me. Um, Just to make a share screen. Uh, hello to everybody. I'm going to uh, present a frame creation model uh, seen uh, uh, through the case study Ohrid UNESCO region. Uh, so, Ohrid uh, UNESCO region. Just one moment. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so Ohrid uh, UNESCO region is a natural and cultural phenomenon. It is uh, Ohrid, uh, there is, uh, it is composed of Ohrid Lake, which provides a refuge for numerous endemic species of freshwater fauna and flora dating from the tertiary period. Uh, also, here are the pictures of the, uh, of the Ohrid region and Ohrid city. Also, it has the oldest, it has the Ohrid city, which is one of the oldest uh, human settlements in the Europe. Uh, so actually the town was built bef between the 7th and the 19th century. And it has uh, many layers from the prehistory, uh, so antique period, Roman period, uh, medieval period, and Ottoman period as well. Uh, then it has uh, the oldest Slav monastery, which is San Pantaleimon. It has also around um, 50 Byzantine churches, uh, early Christian basilica set as well, and medieval churches. Uh, one of them is uh, Santa Sophia, which is placed uh, in the center of the yeah, so in the center of the of the city of Ohrid, and it has uh, remarkable frescoes, which are very important for the history of the fresco painting uh, in the Byzantine in the Byzantine uh, fresco painting. Uh, then it also has around 800 uh, icons which are in a Byzantine style and they're very important for the Byzantine history as well. Uh, then uh, many fortresses, archaeological sites, early Christian basilicas, uh, so also the prehistoric uh, pile dwelling which are placed in the lake. Uh, and all this um, is uh, making that this region was put on the UNESCO list. Uh, here is actually the boundaries of the Ocrit region of UNESCO. And you can see the first picture is that uh, the boundary is actually very large. It comprises uh, three regions of Ohrid, Struga, and Debarca. Uh, there are three cities here as well, the lake, and it is placed on the south part of Macedonia. And on the other picture, you can see actually the city of Ohrid with uh, its um, uh, uh, houses or buildings, the architecture. And uh, here we have a first, second, and third zone. And together with, the, with this uh, gray line, it is actually the boundary zone of the city. 
so uh, the Ohrid region was uh, inscribed on the UNESCO list in 1979. You can see the reference number as well. Uh, only with the natural heritage, while one year later at 1980, it was, um, there was extension by inscription of the UNESCO list with also with the cultural heritage. And uh, with this, uh, actually, Ohrid region is one of the rarest um, regions and cities uh, in, the, uh, in the Europe, in the world as well, uh, that has the both the natural and cultural heritage inscribed on the UNESCO list. Uh, so at 2009, there were minor modifications and 2019, there was extension by inscription of the Albanian part of the lake as well. At uh, 2019, there was a recommendation for inscription of the list of endangered UNESCO sites. Uh, and actually, uh, here it's where the problem uh, begins. And then uh, we have the property area of the, um, uh, of the region. And uh, it is around 94, 95,000, almost 100,000 hectares. So this is very large property and where the buffer zone is around 16,000 hectares. Uh, you should remember this, uh, this amount because uh, we will need them later. Uh, so what is actually the Ohrid uh, region uh, challenge or the problem? Uh, the main problem is devastating the natural and cultural heritage. So we have devastating the natural heritage that Ohrid Lake is losing its endemic character because of the fecal canalization, urbanization and transformation of the coastal landscape, uh, treat from massive tourists. And then we have devastating of the cultural heritage, which is not appropriate urbanization of the city, not appropriate architecture, dimensions, height, uh, which contributes to the total transformation and fragmentation of the uh, visual integrity of the traditional landscape. And also there is not appropriate rehabilitation of the residential and sacral buildings. And this is very important. So who are the stakeholders in this region? The stakeholders, we have many stakeholders. So around seven, it is very complex. We have the municipality, or this is the local government. We have government, it is the central government, business sector, NGO sector, habitants, religious organizations, as well as international organizations like UNESCO, ICOMOS, and IUCN. Uh, then uh, I'm moving next to the phases of the frame, uh, and I will go through the, uh, through the frame with this case study. So the first phase was archaeology, as also my colleagues Anna and Angelina mentioned in their presentations. Uh, so, the first phase uh, needs a deep analysis and investigation of the problem. These analyses are very crucial and uh, we have to deeply investigate the problem and earlier attempts to solve it. So, we have to look behind the problem and behind the reasons why actually the problem was raised. So, we are going to investigate the alternative paths of the action. So what, what is the archaeology of the Ohrid region? What is the problem with this region? So the main problem or the challenge is actually, as we mentioned, devastating actions. And these devastating actions are made from the, uh, from the business sector of the building companies, municipality and inhabitants. Well, on one side, we have the municipality and the business sector that perceive Ohrid as developed region as built and of course with massive tourism. On the other side, we have the habitants and NGOs who are perceiving Ohrid as a region as a more, more calm and we, of course with not so massive tourism. So the devastating actions took part during a long period of time. It is around 40 years. It started uh, on some small scale in the 80s and 90s, but after 20, 2000, uh, this was in very more large scale. And the problems were getting worse and worse. Since Ohrid is UNESCO region under UNESCO protection and Macedonian laws, then you can just imagine that the whole problem was getting even political as well. So the traditional approach to this problem would be to stop building activities and to frozen the inner center of the Ohrid city 
Another problem is that I mentioned before that the boundary of the UNESCO region is very large. It's almost 100,000 hectares. So just imagine stopping all the building activities in um, a space of 100,000 uh, hectares. So OHIT was seeking for another innovation solution, which will include all these seven stakeholders. And during the years, there were many solutions, but none of these was, were accepted uh, nor implemented. Now we are going to the next phase, and that is actually the paradox. What is the, par the, the leading question uh, is, what makes these problems hard to solve? So um, a good method is to express the paradox as clash of rationalities in a series of becomes statements. For example, why? Because. And now when we are seeing our case study, we will look at the main paradox of the Ohrid city uh, will be that the municipality should take measures in order to protect the heritage. Why? Because the city is UNESCO protected. This, this, uh, the landscape in the region cannot be changed because they have universal values. Why? Because the region should be also developed as any other touristic region. So these two statements are in direct contradiction. A temporary solution will be that the building activities and all, all actually all the uh, building and infrastructure activities in the region um, will be temporarily stopped or frozen. But if there is overwhelmed control on the building activities as the solution to frozen all these activities, then the problem will be even deepened. Why? Because the city should be developed as any other touristic city. And why? Because inhabitants would like to see their region developed with all infrastructure road, roads and tourists would like to visit Ohrid as well, so we need more capacities. Now we are moving on the next phase of our frame and this is the context. Research on the practices of the inner circle of the stakeholders uh, which has previously been involved in the problem situation. So we have to put the paradox away and to look at how the participants involved in this problem behave. And now we have to see their process and what they think. Maybe we will find some solution with it. So moving on our case study, the inner circle of the stakeholders which are facing with the problem are actually the local authorities. And these are the municipalities of three regions. This is the owner of the problem. Then central authorities, the government or the Ministry of Culture and the Ministry of Environment, the business sector, companies, tourist providers, etc., the habitants of the city and the region, the international organizations like UNESCO, ECOMOS and IUCN, the NGO sector, NGOs from Ohrid region and North Macedonia, the religious communities, Macedonian Orthodox Church and Islamic religious community, and all these stakeholders were included in the previous attempts of solving the problem. So now we are moving on the next phase, and this is actually the phase of the field. So the, uh, this phase is the inner circle of the stakeholders. We have to widen the context by creating an intellectual, cultural, and social space. This space is called field. So actually, this is the space where the assets, the cultural, economic, in this uh, uh, case, we also have the religious, um, the religious asset. Uh, we'll, uh, so we are looking for the currency that is exchanged between players. Currency could be a value, an interest, a practice, a frame, and everything that can be, uh, can be played, can be put between the players. So it is important to focus on some deeper and universal values. And now we are moving on our case study. Uh, the wider field of the Ohrid region is large. Many tourists are visiting the region actually each year. We have between 20, maybe 30,000 tourists, visitors. The field includes the protected heritage of the inhabitants and also the religious buildings. So the visitors of the cultural events, monuments, religious buildings, and also the artist organizations and the artists that are having events each year. But also this region is the symbol of the country of Macedonia because it is the only UNESCO region and only site in Macedonia. So it is very important not only for the evidence 
in the Ohrid region, also for all the habitants in uh, Macedonia. Now we are moving on the next team, and actually that is how we are looking to identify and seek to understand the deeper factors that underline the motivation and experience of the players in the field. So the purpose is actually to analyze, to understand the universals, which are very relevant for the problem situation. Uh, these universals are usually hidden beneath the surface of the everyday professional lives. So now we are looking at the teams at our case study. The region of the Ohrid has a large significance for the history, for the ecosystem, for the history of the architecture, not only the regional one, but also the worldwide. Uh, then it is the representative of values and culture and the largest tourist center at the same time. So it, uh, it has a universal human heritage. So it is not only the heritage of Macedonia, is the, it, it, is, it belongs to the world actually, and that is why it is universal. And regarding this, we can choose uh, three defined themes that can be a universal cultural and natural value. The first one, the second one, tourism development. And the third one, very important, is the feeling of belonging, regional, but also the religious one. Now we are looking on the next phase. Next phase is the frame, frames. Uh, so this phase means that during the in-depth analysis, common themes emerge that are different from that creates a problem paradox. So uh, we have uh, teams that are shared among many players. They, they are very important. Uh, we have to try on these teams by framing the problems. So we need to have a team with diverse backgrounds because if the, the team is with only one background, then we are looking at the problem only from one side. Now we have to look on the problem on, on many sides. And that is why we have uh, to have a diverse uh, backgrounds, and this is a very good technique. So in our case, the created uh, frames are if we, so, and also it goes with, this, with the statements if then. If we research the problem from the aspect of universal cultural and natural heritage and value, then the city or the municipality should stop all the building activities and all the infrastructure activities. If we research the problem from the aspect of tourism development in and development in general, then the municipality should develop the city and with the building and infrastructure activities should be carried on. If we research the problem from the aspect of feeling of belonging, then the municipality with its uh, natural and cultural values should give more feeling of belonging, which is personal and individual. So the feeling is mainly for the inhabitants, also for the visitors, and the building activities at this, uh, this uh, case should stop. So the next phase is the futures. After the proposed frame is applied to the open problem situation, we have to reshape in the process of co-evaluation. And now we are thinking on a, on a frame to see if we can lead to realistic and uh, viable solution. So um, now we are moving on our case study. By compiling all the frames together, we can find a more alternatives. Uh, we should develop the city in accordance with the international law. So one alternative is putting all the commands on the meanings from the municipality, business factor, central, uh, local, uh, local government, central government, inhabitants, international UNESCO organization, NGO together in one business or strategy plan, it can be a management plan. Then another alternative is to allow building activities and all infrastructure activities, but in, in accordance with the international UNESCO guides and also national guides. And now is the transformation. This phase is very important. This is the next step. It is a critical evaluation of what frames the solution directions. And it can be on short term and also on long term. So in this phase, uh, the representation of ideas is important as a move to explore the merit of conservations with parties in the field. Uh, this phase results in a business plan with together with agenda and strategy for achieving the results. 
Uh, so because we are dealing with radically new approaches, the strategy can have a short-term comp component with a short-term results and also a long-term co co uh, component which requires also a change in the practices of all the stakeholders and their mindset. In our case, <coughs> these ideas are very attractive, will make the city and region to be protected and developed at the same time, uh, but their implementation seeks large ch changes in the practices and mindset of the stakeholders. And you can just imagine we have around uh, seven state we have seven stakeholders how difficult it will be uh, to uh, to change the mindset of these stakeholders so none of the stakeholders do not have experience for this complex process the municipality mm -hmm. together with the uh, government local inhabitants business uh, sector uh, pro, um, then NGOs should listen to each other and discuss openly the problem. The phase results in a business plan and strategy for protection of the region and developing of the region, and that is the management plan of the Ohrid cultural and natural heritage. This plan was starting to be created uh, uh, in 2010, it was finished in 2020, so almost 10 years uh, this plan was uh, um, was um, uh, uh, in, in the phase of creation. And the last phase and, uh, in the, and the, let's say, uh, the most difficult phase is the integration. So this is the phase where, the frame, uh, where we need to make sure that the new frames and the development will be integrated, will be implemented in the broader context of the stakeholders involved. Uh, so we need a new thinking, we need a new opportunities, we need, we need uh, new connections that will arise on a deeper level. Uh, so we, we, will, we will have to all these teams uh, to integrate as uh, within the stakeholders as active knowledge. And also this is the phase where all the stakeholders, we have to be a proactive in their relationship with the environment and also between each, each other. And this is a very crucial ability uh, that the stakeholders will, will, will we have to be open, complex and more dynamic. In our case, this is the, the strategy and the business plan that we have to implement. And after the implementation of this management plan and the frame creation model, the region will, will keep its universal values, they will be protected, they will be, and um, at the same time, uh, the city and the region will be developed, where the building activities and infrastructure activities, of course, will, will can, can carry on, but in smaller scale and with uh, more, let's say, special and protected measures. Uh, so, uh, as you can see, this concept of frame creation model can be implemented. In this case, this was a regional, let's say on a regional level, but also it can be implemented on a global level, on a regional level, on organizational level within the companies, within the organization, on a local level also, and also on a personal and on individual level. So this uh, frame creation model can be implemented on many levels and I hope that uh, it will be very useful also for you. Okay, so now I'm going to, to stop sharing the 